Some, some context to the UK's National Innovation Centre for Ageing. Um, our role is to help develop products and services which help us all to age well for longer. Um, so we all have a stake in developing good products, um, products that we all want, um, products that we, we want irrespective of, of age. Um, our role is also a reflection of the immense global opportunity that, that older consumers offer. Um, by 2040, the spend by older consumers will rise to 63% or 550 billion. So there's an enormous global market economic opportunity, but there's also a, a societal need. Um, and essentially, that's why the UK's National Innovation Centre was, was established about five years ago, something like that. Um, and our role is to, to help develop companies such as the 4Gen Kitchen, which, which Johnny and Peter are part of, um, develop products which are both meaningful and visible, um, but also have the widest possible applicability, both in the UK and internationally. So in terms of sort of how it fits into our role, what, what the National Innovation Centre for Ageing does, we have eight what we call pillars, um, sort of domain areas where we, we work in. So those are housing, um, rurality, mobility and transportation, work, lifestyles, fashion and beauty, entertainment and financial services. And it's interesting that the four, four generational kitchen, um, which, which um, Peter and Johnny will, will, will talk about in, in, in more detail later, spans a lot of those. I mean, it, arguably it's, it's, it's obviously hugely relevant to, to housing, multi-generational housing, how um, we sort of see the future of housing developing. Um, it's also relevant to work, um, as we've seen with the, the COVID pandemic, the way that we think of work, the way that we actively work ourselves has changed enormously. You know, how many of us are actually working from, from kitchens or from, from our kitchen tables? Um, it relates to, to lifestyle, and Johnny will, will talk far more eloquently than I can about the importance of the, the kitchen as a a social space um, where we all want to sort of congregate naturally, where we all congregate naturally. Um, fashion, um, beauty, um, you know, we want a kitchen which is, is, is beautiful, which is aspirational. You know, we, we, we talk about um, products of, of aspiration rather than products of desperation. So things that we would want rather than things that we actually need because for some reason um, our mobility, um, our physical capabilities, or perhaps our mental capabilities have reduced as we age. Um, and also places of entertainment, you know, the, the, um, social interactions are, are, you know, the cornerstone of entertainment. So we, we see the kitchen as covering so many aspects of what um, UK's National Innovation Centre wants to do. Um, the 4Gen Kitchen is a fantastic example of what can be done. Um, it's also, we think, meaningful and visible. Um, so something which individuals, consumers immediately get when they look at it. Um, and it's just something that we've, we've been delighted to, to support and work on for the last three, four years now, I guess. I've worked in the field of um, ageing and equipment for older people for not much less than 30 years. I've seen all kinds of different innovations from businesses, from um, uh, I've worked with the European Commission to look at ideas that people have come up with. I've worked with universities, tried to put some of those on the market, seen all sorts of things. Um, and I was challenged to think about something a bit bigger, something that might actually change an industry uh, and got invited to speak to the kitchen industry where I was very rude about designers. And that's how I met Johnny. Um, fortunately, he didn't hold it against oh, no. me, but um, it was, and it, 
it was the, the problem was that what we were designing was things that nobody wanted. So they may solve a problem, but nobody wanted those things. They weren't, uh, they were not only not aspirational, they were, as Patrick described them, um, products of desperation. And they go, the one thing that I can't ever sell anybody is an older person's kitchen. So is that what we need to develop, an older person's kitchen, or could we rethink that? So um, Johnny and I started to have some discussions. Clearly, Johnny understands aspiration. And you go, OK, so if I, if I could introduce aspiration, then, then I'd, I'd have done half of the, the uh, half, addressed half of the problems. But how do we make something that, that, that actually anybody wants? It doesn't stand out as something designed purely for older people. So when you look at the problems that people have, we, we talk about, um, oh, well, you can't reach because you, uh, you can't reach that high cupboard because your arms are a little bit stiff and all of this kind of stuff. But my wife's five foot tall. She's never been able to reach a high cupboard. It's nothing to do with age for her. It's to do with size. So you, and when you go across a life course, you discover that children can't reach the high cupboards either. And all sorts of people can't do things in kitchens for a whole variety of reasons. So you go, well, if we don't focus on why people have problems, but just solve the problems, maybe, we, and then add Johnny's aspiration, maybe we'd have something that people not only could use, but would want to use. Um, and so that's what we set out to do. Um, and the, the most exciting thing for me um, is that when people see this, and most of them sadly have had to see it virtually so far rather than in person, but we have every cleaner across the university campus seems to end up in our kitchen to come and clean it. Um, so it's really interesting. I've probably sort of interviewed about 30 different cleaners who've come in to sort of wipe it down. That was their official reason for being there. Um, keep it nice and clean and free of COVID and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but actually they walk in and they see immediately something they want. They see home, um, whatever age they are, whatever budget they've got. Um, and you go, OK, so we're on to something here. That's what we wanted, something that everybody would see in it, a kitchen that they wanted, a place that they could socialise with other people. The kitchen's not the place where you cook anymore. I learned that from Johnny a long time ago. That's one of the things you do in it. It's not less than that, but it's so much more than that. It's where we have people around, everybody's in the kitchen. It doesn't matter what else you create for them. They're all in the kitchen. So that's the, that's the place, that's a social space. Um, and um, actually in multi-generational homes, even more so is it the place, because it's the only place that people meet. The youngsters go off and watch films on their iPads and go up to their rooms and so on. But everybody eats together, everybody comes together. And therefore that's a really important part of healthy aging. Again, as Patrick described, that sort of connectedness um, with other people. And so if you can bring that into the built environment as well, then I think you've really uh, got something uh, that's interesting. And that's the feedback that we've got. So that's what we set out to do when we think. <laughs> So, I mean, there's an obvious side to the tech in that it's a, a state-of-the-art um, induction hob, uh, actually made in France, um, uses um, uh, the, the, the sort of more traditional um, sort of induction hob type idea, but also the surface um, adopts the latest international wireless standard, which means you can put your phone down on there and it'll charge your phone if your phone is one of those kinds of phones. Um, you can also put um, uh, cordless appliances down on there and it will, but because it's a high power wireless standard, it will actually make food processes and things like that work. So you just at a functional level, you, you're able to do safe things, but you're also able to get some of the clutter out of the way, all the leads that you have to plug in, all the things that a child can grab and pull something over and, and all the rest of it. So there's that kind of level, but also, um, there's then thinking about um, basic safety. So um, uh, obviously, um, if there's water on the floor, you need to do something about that. So the obvious thing to do is, first of all, to turn off the supply of water until somebody fixes that. 
but also you don't want somebody slipping on the floor. So we put some lighting on the floor, which we can make go blue. So it just makes people aware that there is something on the floor. And we can also talk to uh, Alexa in the corner who starts shouting at you. I've detected there's some water on the floor. Please do something about this and blah, blah, blah. So um, not everybody likes to command what happens through Alexa, but as a way of talking to you, it's, uh, it's very useful. And we also use the Amazon Fire um, tablet uh, to be able to, to do visual things so you can control it in visual ways. So there's those things, obviously, uh, it can detect smoke, carbon monoxide, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, and it does, it does have the ability to turn the power off, for instance. So it can turn the water off and it can turn the power off but it doesn't turn the lights off because you still need to be able to see your way out, um, even if the cooker's on fire. So, so there's, there's that level. Then there's a next level of safety, which is about who's in the kitchen doing what. Um, so this one was designed for eight people across four generations. And when I'm in my kitchen and I'm cooking, I am definitely in charge of the kitchen. Um, uh, everybody's clear about that. Uh, I know what's where, I, I, I keep an eye on things, I regard it as my responsibility to keep the kitchen safe. That's fine when you've got one person doing that. Now imagine eight people from four generations doing different things at the same time. Who owns the safety of whom in the kitchen? Um, it start, you know, things can very quickly happen that you didn't see coming, like the four-year-old opening the knife drawer where, you know, they could do some serious harm to somebody um, in a matter of seconds without obviously intending to. So you can just look and say, is there a responsible adult in this kitchen space? Um, if not, don't let a child open a knife drawer. Um, you know, to just simple, th again, there, it's a higher level of safety because it's now sort of more tied to the circumstances. And then you've also got um, uh, more sort of um, behavioral things in terms of what, what makes it a good experience for people. Um, so um, uh, as you get older, one of the sad things is that because we can't turn our eyes off for um, anything other than while we're asleep, in general terms, uh, we, our, our lenses get more yellow, they uh, we get less light in our eyes, which means that we need brighter light very often. So that means that when it comes to lighting level, if you've got an older person in there, they need to win the argument. So you've got to think about how do I change this so that it's the safest for the person that needs the most, need, need, you know, who wins? When there's lighting levels to decide who wins, well, the person that most needs the most light, um, I would argue. Um, so, so you can start to build in things like that, and then you can think about how some of that stuff can, you can create moods and things like that, because if you can control the lights, you can also can, can control moods. So now we can start to make it sort of aspirational in its behavior, not just protecting in its behavior. So it's all of those different levels, some of which we've achieved, not all of which we've achieved. <laughs> I think it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely kind of witty moment when we, we had grand plans to have the prime minister open this particular project and the building. And then we had Prince Charles. And what we've really got are the cleaners who actually enjoy the kitchen now. And in my opinion, spiritually kind of open it. And one of the reasons I think they like it is because, and this is, this is one of the sadnesses too, is a lot of the surfaces and materials you want to stroke or touch. And actually, it's a, it's a forgotten thing about um, very personal space is that you want to have surfaces and materials that are actually enticing and you want to use and you want to clean uh, rather than industrial surfaces that just simply are going to last a long time. So there's, there's a dialogue there. There's a very interesting dialogue about maintenance and live materials that age well or just age. And in a way, I think that's a slight reflection of aging too. You know, when you step into an old cathedral, and the step, uh, as you go into those big old doors, is worn away by thousands and thousands of people who've been there before, you feel humbled or you feel connected. And I'm not saying we can do that here, but we can use some of the kind of um, understanding that you get from understanding how old buildings 
uh, make people feel. Because actually what we're really talking about here is emotional engagement. And one of the things that, we, that, that I'm trying to do is translate emotions into design, which is very hard and hard to talk about. But I think we've touched on it a little bit here. The real truth is that the, for me, the innovation is partly about the continuation of work I've been trying to do for years, which is to get sociability into the kitchen. And the first thing that, that uh, brings that about is having eye contact. So everything that you can possibly do to get people to work in the middle of the kitchen, not against the wall, absolutely crucial. So that island, for example, with all its bells and whistles kind of thing, is actually a very carefully planned object to create behavioral change. We had uh, one of the slightly kind of dodgier conversations we had, me trying to persuade Peter to give me a little bit of budget, was for the wallpaper. Now, it turns out there's been studies done about um, how people, particularly with, say, Alzheimer's or with memory issues, often their memory may be limited, but when it comes to the visual arts, actually, they're on music, say, they actually often reconnect with moments of, of their, of, of their you know, they come back to life when they're, they're, they're triggered off by these visual memories. Um, and there's, there's an old people's home which uses a fake shop with fake things from the 30s and 50s where um, residents come and use it and they feel really alive, just like listening to some music they heard in their childhood. And it, in, the, in the wallpaper, we actually gave a brief to the artist to create um, um, if you like visual images that are connected to the 50s, 60s and 70s. And so if you, if you zoom in close on the wallpaper, hopefully you'll see kind of this idea of connecting with the emotions and see how it works. Now, when you look at the wallpaper, we, we had a bit of a surprise when we first put it up. It looks a bit like a kind of nursery for a young child or for a posh person's family because of the white background and the small little dots of color. But actually when you're in it, it just triggers off these tiny little I think connections. Um, so the wallpaper is in a way the most kind of a extreme example of that, but in a more connected way, the tiles, for example, behind the, the sink are um, an interesting kind of um, surface. They're, they're actually terracotta, um, a, a high fired terracotta with no glaze on. Once you glaze terracotta, it goes shiny and I think it goes quite harsh. Whereas we put just a very mild um, kind of oil wax on it. And it really does make you feel different in there. It's kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation. It's not like upholstery, but it has a sort of certain kind of softness about it. And as it happens, we developed a technique, which I think was borrowed from an 18th century French technique by which we use the back of a spoon on the terracotta before it's fired. And this creates a slightly effect of kind of, of small mini ridges. Actually, you can hardly really see it. It's more like polishing it. But what it does do is it creates more density so that it doesn't absorb water or oil. So you know, that, that's, that's on one level of innovation. We've got to make it cost effective. So that was always our intent was, yes, it needs to be aspirational, but it's got to be affordable as well. Um, and we've we've more work to do on that, um, but but all the appliances you can buy off the shelf. I mean, we we probably got all the latest appliances um, uh, because they were donated by the manufacturers who don't tend to send you their old ones. <laughs> um, but 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 nonetheless, that all of that stuff there. I mean, some of it, you know, the hot water heater is not the cheapest, but it is the best, and for some very good evidential reasons. And that's why that's the one that we rightly put in the kitchen. Thank you.